Good afternoon and welcome to the third and final pre-conference workshop of Pass Forward 2022. I am Shaw Sprague, Vice President of Government Relations for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I'm pleased to welcome everybody to today's workshop, Federal Advocacy, Positioning Historic Preservation for the Future. Before we get started, I wanted to mention a few logistical notes about our presentation today. The session is being recorded and will be available following the session. We're asking participants to adhere to the Pass Forward Code of Conduct, which can be found in the conference platform on the menu to the left. Uh, if you're seeking continuing education credits, please fill out the attendance form toward the bottom of the session page for AIA credits and self-report for AICP credits. Uh, and finally, questions uh, can be submitted through the chat function and will be addressed during specified Q&A uh, sections of the presentation. And I'll note that uh, the full speaker bios can be found on the conference platform. Uh, next slide, please. So as a roadmap for today, we'll hear our partners from Scenic America who have a track record of successful advocacy campaigns and legislative wins that preserve and enhance the visual character and scenic beauty of the nation. After that, you'll have an opportunity to ask a few questions. And then following that, we'll hear from National Trust staff previewing legislative asks as part of the Pass Forward Federal Advocacy Opportunity. We're happy also to have James Green from Representative Leisure uh, Fernandez's office join us uh, to discuss their initiatives to support the Historic Preservation Fund. And then finally, we're going to close with another section of Q&A. So get those questions ready. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to begin, what we thought we'd do is start with a, uh, a few questions for the audience, a little interactive uh, part of the workshop to gauge everyone's experience conducting federal advocacy. One of the objectives of this session is to uh, ensure that everybody understands the importance of advocacy, uh, but sustained advocacy as well. Uh, and we want to ensure that you're feeling confident about making these calls and outreach to Capitol Hill uh, and in interacting with your elected officials. So uh, bear with us. This is uh, one of the uh, first attempts to activate the polls, but uh, they should appear in the poll tab of your chat menu. Uh, take a look for that. Uh, there are three questions for you to answer. And I'm going to give everyone just a few moments to make their selections. And uh, then we'll, we'll go over some of those results. But uh, take a moment now and answer those three questions. We'll give everybody about a minute. And uh, we'll come back and, and see how we're doing. Um, Really, the, the point here is seeing what people's experience is like in the advocacy space and how frequently that interaction is occurring, which will help all of our uh, panelists and experts uh, um, advise on best ways and approaches to interact with Congress. So we're going to. Give it just a few more seconds here. Okay, so let's uh, go to our first question. Would you say you have an established relationship with your federal elected officials? Uh, and, drum roll please, uh, yes, answer is 37%. So. Uh, we're getting close to half of, of everybody has uh, a relationship with federal uh, federal officials. That's 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 pretty good. Um, uh, uh, that interaction is key, and to have those relationships is really such an important part of uh, effective advocacy. So, for our next question, how frequently do you meet with your federal elected officials? Uh, let's see. Once a year, 81%, twice a year, 8.7%, three times a year, 
seven percent. So isn't that uh, interesting? Um, so most, uh, the overwhelming majority of of folks are connecting once a year with with advocates. Um, and you know, from from that, I think we can glean that. Uh, you know, hearing from once a year, this isn't, uh, you know, this is more like calling grandma, not uh, not uh, elected officials. We do want to see more interaction with uh, elected officials. And um, so more than once a year, it's good, good to check in. So we're going to cover some of that in today's webinar. Uh, and let's see, final question. Have you hosted or participated in an in-district meeting with federal elected officials? Yes, 12.5%. So these uh, in-district meetings are a key way to demonstrate um, to, to elected officials the importance of the policies we're pursuing, whether that be funding or tax incentives or legislation to establish protections for important historic places. Uh, if a picture is a thousand words, actually visiting a place is, is worth even more. Uh, it really goes a long way. So glad to see a number of folks uh, uh, Having done that, it, it is a lot of work. So we appreciate those 13% uh, of, of the group who, who have uh, conducted those meetings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Falzone. Mark has been president of Scenic America since April 2017. And since his arrival, Scenic America has increased its investment in lobbying research, communications, and additional tools to further the organization's mission. And as a result, Scenic America has achieved many legislative wins. Prior to his arrival at, uh, uh, at Scenic America, Mark also served as a five-term elected member of the House of Representatives in Massachusetts. Uh, as a member of the National Conference of State Legislatures, he was also twice elected to that executive committee. So we're lucky to have Mark here today uh, to share his experience uh, running Scenic America. Uh, and I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Can you provide us with an overview of some of the important federal advocacy and what constitutes an, a successful advocacy campaign? Great. Thanks so much, Shaw. And um, uh, let me just first, Shaw, start with uh, just a little bit of background about Scenic America. Scenic America is the only national nonprofit that's uh, specifically focused in enhancing the visual character of our country. Uh, and uh, we have over 40 state and local chapters and affiliates and hundreds of volunteers and thousands of supporters across the country. And so we are excited to be uh, with you here today, Shaw and your team at the National Trust. Uh, we have a lot uh, that we on. Uh, we both uh, think that historic preservation is important, for example. Uh, and uh, is seen from the Scenic America standpoint, we view that as uh, critical to uh, scenic beauty. Uh, so uh, we'll go to the next slide here. So as we uh, uh, our key issues at Scenic America, you'll see that uh, we have five of them, preserving and enhancing community character, uh, which by the way, again, historic preservation would be sort of under that uh, uh, category. Uh, as well as uh, good uh, promoting best practices and placemaking like that. Um, we also um, care about honoring our parks and open spaces, in including the gateway communities that host them. And so that's a, a lot of work we do uh, in that area is with gateway communities. We also um, celebrate America's scenic byways, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that today and some of our uh, legislative successes and how we uh, did that uh, today. Uh, also, uh, undergrounding utility infrastructure is a big priority for us. We had uh, three victories in that in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, whatever your uh, term of art is for uh, the law that passed about a year ago in Congress, uh, the Infrastructure Bill. And uh, finally, we promote beautiful highways, and we do that in a number of ways, but one of them is uh, fighting against billboard blight, uh, trying to uh, reduce the amount of billboards in our streets uh, and also uh, uh, we're very pro-tree so we'd rather see trees than billboards so we'll go to the next slide 
Um, so, uh, and you know, bef uh, so our advocacy wins include, uh, and I try to touch base on some of these. Um, we had the reviving America, the reviving the National Scenic Byways Program. It was called the Reviving America's Scenic Byways Act of 2019. Uh, you know, Scenic America uh, has was founded in 1982, and we hadn't had a win um, uh, that we authored in Congress. We had one had some defensive wins where we beat back, you know, some bad bills, but we had never had a, a proactive win where something that we you know, authored became law. And uh, the Reviving America Scenic Byways Act of 2019 um, was the first time that we were able to do that. Uh, I became the CEO of Scenic America in 2017 and, and uh, brought some, ag um, you know, expertise to the organization. And uh, um, so we were able to do this. And so I want to, the reason I mentioned this is, you know, I want to be clear that, um, you know, having a win even in uh, a jurisdiction like Congress, is doable uh, within a few years of starting or really plotting out the steps uh, uh, that are needed uh, in a systematic way. And, 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 you know, success is very, very achievable. If it can be done in Congress within, you know, a, a couple of years, then it could certainly be done anywhere. Because uh, uh, Congress is not the easiest place to get uh, uh, bills passed. I, I uh, used to lecture in uh, college. I used to be an adjunct professor. And one of the things I would always say is, you know, American democracy is actually not built, not built to pass laws. It's built to block legislation. So, um, and that's the, uh, having two, two houses of Congress and, and a separately elected president, um, uh, all who, of whom may be in different parties. That's, that's where that comes from. Um, so um, uh, so that was our first key win and really got us on the map in Congress and led to a lot of momentum for us. We followed with securing funding for the National Scenic Byways Program. So whereas the first bullet was more about um, reactivating the program and uh, directing federal highways to uh, do a new round of designations of scenic byways, uh, uh, on the other hand, you know, this is actually bringing funds to the Scenic Byways program. So uh, uh, we got um, a total of uh, 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 20, $26 million, uh, excuse me, $22 million uh, that uh, is in there, which isn't big money compared to other things in Congress. But for this program, it was a, a good starting number, particularly since there had been no funding for the program in 10 years. And as Shaw or anybody else in advocacy will tell you, it's much, much harder to go from zero dollars to anything more than zero than it is, you know, to go greater than zero to another number greater than that number. Uh, what I'm trying to say is it's a lot harder to go from nothing than it is from something. Um, and so uh, that's really uh, um, uh, was a, a great victory for us as well. And um, and. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we, you know, got. Uh, but um, I'd also mention, I, I briefly mentioned the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And so in there, we had three victories for utility undergrounding and one for gateway communities uh, that are uh, gateway communities to parks and open space. Uh, so I'll mention uh, first the gateway communities victory, the Federal Lands Access Program, or FLAP, if, uh, you know, I'm in Washington, D.C., and we love our our acronyms. And uh, so the Federal Lands Access Program becomes FLAP. And um, that's a program that is really geared toward gateway communities. It basically is a program that funds, funds um, excuse me, roadways that are uh, um, lead to national parks or lead to federal lands. It doesn't have to be a national park. Lead to federal lands. Uh, not the ones that are in the federal lands. That's actually a different funding program called the Federal Lands Transfer Program. But um, the Federal Lands Access Program are the roads that lead to these federal lands. And so that's a really good definition of gateway communities. And uh, we we're able to help uh, increase the funds uh, for that and also had some definition changes. So that way they could be, the funds could be used for more things such as landscaping and removal of, and so we're thrilled with our victory there. Also for utility undergrounding, 
we had three victories. Uh, uh, one um, that was uh, had to do with um, uh, five billion dollars, uh, uh, a five billion dollar pot of money for uh, grid resiliency, of which utility undergrounding is one of the eligible expenses for that, and we expect that that's going to be a major expense that is paid out of that. A second um, uh, win that we had was uh, had to do with the $32 billion National Highway Performance uh, Program. And uh, for that program, that is sort of the program that funds most of our highways. And, um, and, uh, and so it's a big pot of money, $32 billion a year. And um, uh, I don't expect it. Undergrounding is now an eligible expense within that program. Now, I don't expect to go toward undergrounding, but if a street, uh, if a road or highway is now being repaired and uh, the overhead wires are there, you can actually now put them underground and use those federal dollars for that. So that was a big win as well. And then uh, third, uh, another great win we had for uh, utility undergrounding um, uh, had to do with FEMA. And when there's a you know, federal, uh, federally declared emergency and FEMA has to come into an area and help with disaster relief. Uh, it, you know, it's generally the case that FEMA will only provide federal funds to build things as they were and with no enhancements. But that was a little bit foolish when it came to overhead wires, because in many cases, you know, there's a lot of hurricanes that are blowing down the same overhead wires over and over again. And so we thought, you know, it really made sense to rebuild underground and have federal funds uh, be used for that. And that is indeed now a uh, FEMA funds. And so we got the what's called the Stafford Act, which is a uh, which is what governs FEMA uh, um, amended. So that way now FEMA federal funds can be used to take those overhead wires that are were downed during a disaster and put them uh, underground. And we'll go so um, let's talk about uh, uh, what are the basics uh, for advocacy. Um, so, you know, I found it interesting um, um, uh, that, um, uh, uh, you know, well, let me start with messaging. First, we want a message very clear, very consistent, timely, and relevant. So, um, and let me walk through each one of those four points. Um, you know, when you're crafting a message, and this is true in any communications endeavor, whether it's trying to lobby for a bill in Congress or trying to position a program in a certain way to the general public. So, um, you know, what you want to do is you want to craft your message, your messenger, and the method of delivery or the channel. Um, you want to tailor all that to the audience. So whenever we're thinking of messaging or in general or communications in general, we want to think of the audience first. And in this case, our audience is Congress. And so um, so we want to think terms of what would a member of Congress want to hear. So when it comes to scenic byways, we could talk about how scenic byways, uh, the country more beautiful, or the historical relevance of them, or the cultural re relevance of them. And I, I say that because some scenic byways are just beautiful places uh, like uh, uh, Highway of Legends in Colorado, or some are historically uh, based such as the uh, Selma to Montgomery in Alabama, uh, you know, obviously has an important civil rights uh, bent to it. But those are not the, it, those are not, none of those are the messages that we give to Congress. Because if we're thinking of Congress, what is it that they generally care about? And so um, uh, our experience tells us that Congress, when it comes to scenic byways, the best argument to present is economic development because scenic byways do indeed bring great economic development to the areas in which they're in. Now, part of that is because of tourism. Uh, there are a lot of country that want to just ride the scenic byways and they will spend money along them. And they will also connect, you know, um, urban and suburban areas to rural areas. And so you're sort of bringing this economic development and spending money to places that wouldn't necessarily norm normally get it. And that is a message that works with Congress. And so when you're thinking of your messaging, you know, you want to first think about like, what should the message be? And 
In this case, you you know you always want to tailor it to your audience. In this case, the audience is Congress. Um, once you have that message, you want to make sure it's simple and clear, right? And 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 be repetitive. So when we say consistent, you want to repeat it over and over. in some cases you're going to think, well, they've already heard that. I mean, they need to hear a different argument. No, no, mess consistency in messaging is really important. So that way um, the message sinks in. You know, saying it once or twice or three times is not enough. Usually it needs to be seven or eight or nine times until somebody sort of absorbs the message. That's really important. Time important uh, and uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, making sure that, you know, you are reaching out at the key times. And so, you know, if you know there is a certain schedule for like uh, a bill, you know, passing like an appropriations bill, for instance, there are certain key moments where you need to be advocating to the right people, whether it's a member of Congress or committee staff or whatever it is. And so doing your research to understand the process is critical for that timeliness. And then um, relevance, uh, obviously this has to do with the message itself itself um, is making sure that um, you to the audience. Again, I can't stress that enough. Uh, allies and partnerships are critical. Right? You, you don't, you know, you're, you can do things alone, but you're stronger if you do things together, right? Uh, because um, if, if a member of Congress sees, oh, wow, there's a whole group of people supporting this, that's going to get their attention. Most importantly, you want to make sure you don't have, you know, two different groups saying different things because that is where gridlock sets in. Because if a member of Congress is hearing two different messages or two different priorities from what they consider two like-minded groups, then in their mind, all they're gonna hear is that, and they're gonna say, you know what? It might be safer to do nothing. So um, that's critical as well. Relationships with public officials, are they're critical. Now, interestingly, we saw the poll that said, uh, I believe it said 37% um, uh, of uh, people feel though they have an established relationship with your federal officials. So that's 63% uh, then do not feel that way. Um, and I would also mention how that aligns with, um, I know 81% of people visit with their federal elected officials offices once a year. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us that you understand, which is once a year is probably not enough to establish a relationship. Right. Uh, and we learned that from the poll. And uh, and it is indeed true. You want to have multiple um, you know, meetings with elected officials, with your public officials uh, per year, um, a mix of. You know, in these days, Zoom uh, teams or you know, virtual is good, uh, you know, an in-person meeting in Washington, D.C. doesn't hurt. And certainly an in-district meeting doesn't hurt either. And so, you know, getting that mix together, depending on you know, the resources that you have and what you're able to do. But rep repetition is really important. And um, uh, and um, so that's really critical in terms of um, uh, um, working with uh, uh, your public officials. Repetition, meeting with them often, and, um, uh, and, you know, not just the district office, but the D.C. office as well. And oftentimes, if you're working with a national partner, such as the National Trust, Shaw and his team can help coordinate those if there is an overarching national trust priority that you're working on. So that's great. That's what we do at Scenic America as well. Um, the ability to work grassroots to grass tops um, is uh, also critical. So, you know, you know, uh, you know, grassroots advocacy. Um, a lot of that is digital these days. Some of it is in person, but also the grass top folks uh, are going to be sort of your VIPs where maybe they know the elected official personally or they have a relationship with them. And, you know, um, or maybe they're a local elected official themselves. And so they're going to get the attention of the federal elected official. You know, so that's the difference between working grassroots and grass tops. Ideally, you do both. Um, because again, it's a mix of, uh, of, of all these different pieces of advocacy that really make this successful. So um, with that said, I'll go to the next slide. And um, uh, I'm gonna just briefly touch here on the National Scenic Byways Program, um, uh, but um, I'm gonna go through this slide pretty quickly because um, I wanna make sure that we stay on track. 
And, um, uh, you know, Byways program, I already mentioned that it um, recognizes roads that demonstrate one or more intrinsic qualities. What I didn't mention is what are all of those qualities. So I mentioned that some are scenic, some are historic, some are cultural. There's also natural, archaeological, and recreational. So you can be designated for a variety of criteria. And you need to demonstrate at least one of the intrinsic criteria. And so not all scenic byways are strictly scenic. You know, they could have one of these other criteria as well. Um, you can see the other information on the slide here, but uh, uh, the big takeaway is that there's over 1,200 in the country, and I already mentioned that funding had lapsed 10 years ago, and there were no new de designation until Scenic America came along and fixed both of these issues in the last bullet. We'll go to the next slide. And um, so uh, this tied into our organizational priorities, caught members of, uh, uh, ca caught the interest of members of Congress in both parties. The critical thing is we always try to do things in a bipartisan way when possible. Uh, so we had both Republican and Democratic champions uh, in both the House and Senate, uh, uh, bipartisan, uh, bicameral. And so that's really critical. Um, and so uh, we had a strong public appeal, uh, public appeal to help fuel grassroots petitions and targeted action. So that's our grassroots piece. We also had certain key uh, supporters of Scenic America meet with their members of Congress from a grass tops perspective. And so that's critical as well. And um, this uh, uh, led uh, to um, uh, the culmination of the passing of the Reviving America 2019. And so that was uh, a new legislation that called for byways nominations, but like I said, didn't have funding, but we were able to get funding in a later uh, piece. And that was also part of a grand strategy of reviving the program first, getting it active, and then later asking for money. We on purpose. That was a plotted out strategy. We'll go to the next slide. So um, you can see here that um, this is how we um, were able to uh, take the next steps, that um, uh, we did get $22 million in funding. We're looking for another 23. And so, um, you know, this was really um, all part of that grand strategy. We can go to the next slide. And, uh, you know, there are external, positive externalities to advocacy, right? There are, you know, lots of byproducts, good byproducts. We saw a fourfold increase in website traffic after the newest designations were announced. We were actually cited all over the, uh, we had a lot of press coverage in major national outlets because of uh, the new designations. And um, we actually uh, received two awards for our byways work, uh, one and one, one for advocacy uh, from the American Society of Association Executives. So to you know to, to sort of win awards for our work was also exciting for us. Let me go to the next slide. And so um, you know one of the one of the things I'd like to ask you to do today is take action right now. So you can be a part of this right now. So not often do people actually encourage you to leave your screen for a moment, but if you go to www.scenic.org slash FY23 byways, then you'll be able to advocate for more funding for byways as well right now. So I'd ask you to just take 10 seconds, that's all it takes, go to that website, www.scenic.org slash FY23 byways, and right now you could take action on that. And I'd ask somebody to post that uh, a link in the chat as well uh, to make this a little easier for folks. And so that way um, we can move off this slide as well. Um, but um, take a moment, get that done now, and you'll be helping to advocate. So you'll be a part of the grassroots to advocate for scenic byways. And, you know, that is at a basic level um, how we do this and how we get this done and also how you can be a part of the grassroots just that easily. We try to miss so that way they can advocate for us. Again, www.scenic.org slash FY23 byways. And we can go to the next slide. So I wanna thank you for you know, your attention here. And uh, in a nutshell, that's what uh, Scenic America has been doing here. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, well, Mark, thanks so much. That's a, a great overview of uh, the advocacy basics. Uh, you would certainly know well with your experience uh, in state legislature and 
a wonderful recap of, of the work of, of Scenic America. Uh, we do have a, a good question uh, that does combine uh, the National Historic Preservation Act into it. And that question, Mark, is uh, will the availability of federal funding for the undergrounding of wires increase the amount of Section 106 reviews uh, that power companies will will undergo? And um, uh, have you experienced uh, those companies not wanting to go along with the undergrounding because of that uh, that review process. I'm not sure how closely you are uh, connected to that aspect of the work, but um, yeah. an interesting question. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, you know, so do I think it will increase the number of 106 reviews? Um, I suppose, yes. Um, um, you know, that will be something that will probably be com come of this simply because if any of these, you know, wires are in, that are proposed to be undergrounded are in places that are subject to 106, then sure, um, um, they would obviously then, you know, have to go through. certain that that number is going to be greater than zero, right? And so um, the answer is, the answer would have to be then, yes, that would increase the amount of 106 reviews. Um, and do I think that a new federal nexus will decrease the number of companies that want to do it as a result? Um, you know, um, I actually don't think so. And the reason is because this is money that, that the companies would be getting. Uh, and so that's the federal incentive, right? Um, you know, um, there is it is a match, you know, um, so it's not completely free money. But, um, you know, if you are, you know, uh, for example, F Florida Power and Light, and you already have an undergrounding, you know, um, program going in the state of Florida, because you, you had prior done you know five years of what they called hardening which was basically instead of wood poles concrete poles and you found out that hurricanes uh don't care if it's wood or concrete they're still going to blow it down <laughs> um you know then uh then and if you're a utility provider like florida power and light that, that came across this lesson actually absorbed the lesson and um uh you know and um uh, and did something with it then um um then what were able to do is um, uh, that, and um, uh, uh, you know they were they are able to take this money, put up the money that they're already using to match, and uh, do it. So I don't think it's going to discourage. I think it will encourage undergrounding. Good point. Thank you, Mark. Um, we we do have another question about uh, funding for scenic byways before your tenure there uh, um, in the, the surface transportation bills uh, prior to that. Uh, maybe you can speak to just um, how programs that uh, yeah I'm without happy a, to without a clear advocate uh, on the hill uh, can go dark for a while. Yeah, that's that's so. This is Shaw. You just nailed it on the head. So you know, um, so I was hired by Scenic America in 2017, right? And so, so during the intervening time, Scenic America was not active on Capitol Hill. We actually had no staff even living in Washington D.C. at the time. And so when you sort of ignore um, policymakers, you know, and you're not sort of doing that advocacy and constant relationship building, then your priorities are not going to do well. Um, you know, this is not something that you can let lie fallow, uh, because if you do, then you will lose funding, which is exactly what happened, Carl. Um, you know, uh, you know, whether it be Scenic America or other Scenic Byways advocates out there, uh, we were not doing our job, you know, and the board of Scenic America, um, when I was hired, made it clear that this was a priority um, for the organization. They knew that they needed to hire somebody in Washington, D.C. to run the organization because we are sort of advocacy, an advocacy-focused organization. When I got to, to Scenic America, we had no advocacy program whatsoever. So we literally built this from scratch, you know, starting in, you know, late April 2017 was my hire date, right? 
and you know took took a few months just to sort of um, uh, you know learn where the bathroom is, etc. And um, went about writing and creating uh, a congressional agenda, the legislation that goes along with that, and starting to build the relationships and just literally pounding the halls of Congress, like just you know uh, making relationships. It's it's really just that um, uh, you know type of dogged determined combined with a good solid strategy. So um, you know, uh, so that's where it comes from. Thanks, Carl. Mark, well, thanks. Uh, I think that's uh, those are the questions we've seen come through. But if if you wouldn't mind sticking around through the end of the uh, the workshop for for the uh, remaining Q and A, uh, your great resource uh, for for questions on this, and, and thank you for emphasizing the importance of uh, repeating that message and uh, you know why why having a relationship where you're communicating several times uh, a year is so important. Uh, I think that um, I think that was really helpful for folks to hear. Thanks, Sean. We love working with the National Trust, so um, we're glad to be here as partners. You bet. Great. So now we're going to switch over to uh, some of the legislative priorities uh, that we uh, are outlining for advocacy that's coming up. Uh, associated uh, advocacy during the Pass Forward Conference. Um, so the government relations team at the Trust has worked to, uh, to uh, with our preservation partners from nearly every state to serve as advocacy captains and lead virtual Hill meetings during the conference week. And uh, for the folks that are on today that have not gone into the Pass Forward registration portal and clicked on uh, uh, update options, uh, please do that and, and add advocacy uh, as, as part of your registration. We'd love to have you join and you know you should feel free to join just to see uh, how these meetings go, familiarize yourself with it or to come on and help us make the case uh, for some of these important programs. So we currently have over 150 uh, advocates uh, as part of the pass forward registration process, but but we'd love to have you along as well. Uh, you do have until next couple days to register uh, to modify those options, and I believe you you will still have that ability even during the conference. But uh, if you can get it done in the next couple days, that's that's great. Um, and I think we we do want to note that these visits are occurring at a critical time in the legislative cycle. And we are a few weeks away from the midterm elections, as you know. Uh, and following that, Congress will enter uh, into what's referred to as its lame duck session. Uh, and that's where Congress will continue to meet if it's, if it's so inclined until the next Congress, the new Congress, is sworn in in January. Uh, and it's often... Congress, you often see Congress uh, legislative activity pick up when there is a bit of a backstop. Uh, when there's a deadline, that's when you see congressional action. Uh, so we've got a deadline, but will we see legislative action? It, it depends a little bit on the outcome of the election. Uh, uh, will the chambers in Congress flip? How much will they flip? Uh, and all those those numbers and calculations will factor into how active uh, a, a lame duck session may be. But we're hopeful that uh, that there will still be a number of preservation bills that uh, could move during the lame duck. And so we want to make sure advocates are prepared to deliver the message uh, and um, uh, that we're poised to take advantage of an active lame duck session. So uh, to prepare advocates for upcoming Hill meetings, we've developed three one-pagers that touch on key preservation issues. This includes the historic tax credit, public lands legislation, and the historic preservation fund. And you can find these on the session page under attachments. And now we're going to take this opportunity to preview these legislative asks uh, that are in those documents. And I'm going to just begin by diving into the historic tax credit. And perhaps as, as many of you know, uh, the historic tax credit 
uh, is the most significant investment the federal government makes to historic preservation. We've seen uh, more than 47,000 buildings preserved uh, and rehabilitated using the historic tax credit. And for the folks that aren't as familiar with this credit, it is a 20% uh, income tax credit that can be applied to quali uh, qualified rehabilitation expenses uh, for income producing historic buildings. Uh, during the 2017 tax reform bill, the credit went from a so-called one year credit, meaning you could take it in uh, uh, a single year to spread out over five years, um, which did reduce some of the value of the credit. And so since 2017, the historic tax credit has been uh, a slightly weakened credit, less, just slightly less of an incentive uh, since those changes. And so part of our advocacy is to help uh, enhance the value of the credit and modernize it. It hasn't been uh, adjusted in, in, uh, or strengthened since uh, over the last more than 40 years. And so uh, we are uh, strongly advocating for the passage of the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act. This was introduced uh, in the House as HR 2294 and in the Senate as 2266. Uh, and it would do just that. It would modernize the credit in, in several ways, but it would essentially um, address, uh, it would improve the, the value of the credit uh, from an investment standpoint. It would also uh, improve access to the credit, both for Main Street communities, rural communities, urban communities as well. And uh, one of the key provisions there is that it would uh, better align the historic tax credit with the uh, uh, affordable housing credit, the low income housing tax credit. Uh, and it would, it would, and these points are spelled out in uh, both the the one pagers, but also the supplemental talking points that we'll provide as part of the advocacy and outreach. Uh, so we, we do have the technical information available to you, but essentially uh, there are these two real estate tax incentives that work well together and, uh, and they could work even better together if some of these changes in the HTC Go bill were passed, uh, specifically the basis adjustment provision. Uh, which is how things work in affordable housing. And if you have the same approach in, in historic, uh, you'll have more developers that are looking to combine those credits. And that's, that's one key objective of the legislation. Uh, the, the other part of the credit is that it would try to help improve access to the credit for those smaller uh, historic tax credit projects. And it would do that by uh, making the uh, uh, substantial rehabilitation test easier to satisfy. Uh, it would do that by lowering the amount that you need to invest in a property to qualify for the credit uh, uh, from 100% of a building's basis to 50%. So it just makes qualifying for the credit that much easier. Uh, and then there's also a provision that would increase the value of the credit from a 20% credit to a 30% credit for deals that are uh, less than 2.5 million uh, in QREs. So that is targeting those, those smaller communities uh, where, where uh, it's often more difficult to drive that investment. Um, but once you do, uh, uh, it is a, a five to one return. So there are a number of really strong economic arguments to make to Congress about uh, the impact of the credit it's job creating potential. There are more than 3 million jobs created as a result of the program since its inception. And also that it provides a return to Treasury over the life of the credit. So uh, uh, over the life of the credit, um, where are my talking points here? Well, maybe we can get those up in the chat. But essentially, uh, more, more funding has come back to Treasury uh, in the form of tax revenue than has gone out in tax credits. And that's a key point to make with uh, legislators of, of all stripes uh, because it shows a strong return on investment uh, for, this, for this program. Um, 
And uh, let's see. So co-sponsorship goals. Uh, we did reach a really exciting milestone, uh, having uh, reached 100 co-sponsors in the house. That is, uh, uh, I believe it's 58 Democrats, 42 Republicans in the House. So that's really strong bipartisan support, uh, a very bipartisan bill, in fact. Uh, and so reaching that 100 co-sponsorship goal is uh, extremely, um, uh, we should take a lot of uh, solace in that and reaching that milestone as a, as a preservation community. Uh, we have an, an opportunity over the next week to increase those numbers and finish this this uh, Congress uh, in a, uh, with the, the most we've ever had uh, in, in more than a decade, probably. And so uh, that's important for a couple of reasons. One, we, we do have an opportunity to to push for passage of HTC Go in year end tax legislation the so-called tax extender bill, which is often a piece of legislation that you see come up at the end of a, uh, at the end of a Congress, uh, at the end of a year, in fact, depending on which tax uh, programs are expiring, there usually are at least a few every year. And so it's often considered something that, that needs to get done. And uh, this, is, this is an opportunity for the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act to attach uh, either the whole bill or uh, parts of it. Uh, but we, we want to make sure that we're at the table and uh, voicing support for inclusion in that in any year-end tax bill uh, so we can, we can implement those changes and, and modernize the credit uh, and, and then roll over into the next Congress with a strong showing uh, of support for this credit if not all of those provisions make it into a year-end tax bill. So uh, I mentioned the uh, year-end tax legislation. Uh, um, we won't know yet, again, uh, in, ter in terms of the lame duck session, how much appetite there will be to address that. Sometimes they push it, push it into the next Congress, but right now, again, we've got a backstop and we've got an opportunity where, where uh, Congress will be considering legislation and we have an opportunity to, to have a seat at the table there. So I believe that's uh, it for the historic tax credit. I'm going to uh, change the slide, please. And we uh, now we have the pleasure of hearing from my colleague, uh, Pam Bowman, who leads the National Trust Public Lands work, including legislative work on behalf of historic and cultural resources. She has over 16 years of experience working in Congress as a lobbyist uh, on federal policy issues, providing advocacy trainings, doing appropriations work, and designing national and international advocacy campaigns. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Pam to provide us an overview on, on some of the legislation that you're working on. Thank you, Shaw, and thanks everyone for joining today. Um, like Shaw mentioned, one area of the National Trust advocacy work is preserving and protecting historic and cultural resources on federal public lands. And so very broadly, that work uh, includes work on legislation, appropriations, and often the public policy work that goes along with that. Um, we do a lot of this work, um, especially when there's an opportunity to pursue a legislative or an administrative designation. Uh, sometimes that's a National Park Service unit or a National Monument designation, um, but anywhere where we can try to get some permanent protection for a significant historic place. And before I go any further, I just want to share a thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, many of you attended the National Trust's Pass Forward Conference last fall, including an advocacy webinar similar to this. And your advocacy contributions last year helped get two of the bills from our ask list at those virtual Hill meetings enacted into law by the president in the last year, which are really our uh, big wins for the preservation community and demonstrate that this work um, and this advocacy truly does make an impact. And we are hoping that the same will be true for the three bills I'm about to highlight for you um, as part of our federal public lands work. 
Um, and as Shaw already mentioned, um, there's still uncertainty about what the rest of this calendar year looks like in terms of the lame duck session after the midterm elections. But several of these bills have made uh, substantial progress um, during the last two years in this Congress, and we're hopeful there could be some opportunity between now and the end of the year uh, to advance these bills even further. And for each of these ones that I'll mention, uh, we have multiple resources available to you uh, to help you engage in that advocacy. Uh, we have the one pager designed specifically for uh, Pass Forward and the visits next week. And please also go to our website, www.savingplaces.org. Um, that has additional website re uh, resources, including some free tools where you can send letters to congressional offices and places to sign petitions uh, supporting some of these key pieces of legislation. Uh, next slide, please. The first bill that we're featuring for our advocacy work in this space is the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act. Um, the protection and documentation of African American burial grounds has long been neglected, and many African American burial grounds are in a state of disrepair, uh, are inaccessible or unmapped. And legislation has been introduced in both the House and the Senate by a bipartisan group of lawmakers led by Senators Sherrod Brown and Mitt Romney in the Senate and in the House by Representatives Alma Adams, Don McKeach, and Brian Fitzpatrick. Um, if this bill were to be enacted, uh, this important legislation would authorize the National Park Service to establish a $3 million grant program in coordination with governmental, private, and nonprofit groups. And that would assist communities across the country in identifying, preserving, and restoring these historic and cultural sites. Another thing the bill would do is establish a voluntary national network of historic burial grounds and help with the discovery of these places of tribute and memory ahead of any commercial development that may be taking place to avoid disturbances of the locations. So one of the asks in Hill meetings uh, the next few days and weeks with both House and Senate offices is that they co-sponsor and support this legislation. Uh, both the House and the Senate bills have had good subcommittee hearings in this Congress with the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee already reporting the bill out favorably, um, eligible for a floor vote. So we are hopeful that additional co-sponsors uh, will continue the momentum on this legislation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the next bill um, we wanted to share with you is the Route 66 National Historic Trail Designation Act. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the historic Route 66 stretches approximately 2,400 miles from Chicago, Illinois, all the way to Santa Monica, California, uh, passing through eight states and more than 300 rural and urban communities. There are numerous buildings along Route 66 that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and it was designated a National Scenic Byway in four states. This legislation would designate Route 66 as a National Historic Trail that would be administered by the National Park Service. And this is following a 1995 study by the National Park Service that determined that Route 66 met the eligibility requirements. A couple Congresses ago, this bill had a bipartisan and bicameral support and a unanimous House floor vote. And we've seen the same thing in this Congress and committee where in the House, um, there was a successful hearing and it passed the committee unanimously. So we're also hopeful uh, for additional action on this bill in the coming weeks and months. So one of the asks in these Hill meetings, particularly those eight states um, that are bisected by Route 66, um, is that they co-sponsor and support this bill. Um, we have a number of resources that we can share with you on this legislation. And just to let you know about the really significant support for this legislation, uh, petition signatures in support of this designation number over 71,000 um, from 49 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico with over 80 organizations, uh, businesses and local governments um, expressing their support um, for this designation. Um, and if you haven't already, please visit um, the website I mentioned before to add your name to that petition on our website. Uh, next slide, please. The third bill I wanted to mention to you is the Great Bend of the Gila Conservation Act. 
The unique uh, and sacred Great Bend of the Gila landscape uh, located in Arizona is one of the most significant cultural sites in the Southwest. Um, there at least 13 federally recognized tribes maintain cultural connections and there's traces of human presence dating back to 3000 BC. The National Trust has been supportive of this designation for many years and has been featured in our National Treasure Campaign. And what the bill would do is it would establish a 330,000 acre Great Bend of the Gila National Conservation Area and protecting unique sites such as rock, or, rock art um, and other cultural artifacts. It would also establish another national conservation area and, neither, and nearly just about 60,000 acres of new wilderness. Also included in that bill are provisions that would significantly enhance the role of tribal governments in the land management process. And that includes some of the language modeling after the Bears Ears Intertribal Commission, which provides a unique and recent example of tribes co-managing public lands. So one of the asks in Hill meetings uh, with house offices, especially those in Arizona and the surrounding states, is that they co-sponsor and support this bill. And I think we can go to the next slide now. I am now pleased to introduce the next speaker, uh, James Green, who's gonna share with us some information about the Historic Preservation Fund. James is a legislative assistant in Representative Legere Fernandez's office, where he handles several issues, including those important to the preservation community. And James, thank you uh, to you and the Congresswoman for all your leadership and efforts on important preservation issues and for making time to join us today. Um, I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Pam, uh, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to join you all uh, this afternoon. And, you know, as Pam mentioned, my name is James. I'm a legislative assistant for Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, uh, and I support her work on the Natural Resources Committee. And for those of you all that are not familiar with the Congresswoman or New Mexico's beautiful third district that she represents, uh, this is the Congresswoman's first term in Congress. and. And prior to coming to DC, she was a public interest lawyer in New Mexico uh, for, for decades and, and worked to bring services and funding to uh, the rural communities that she now represents, uh, as well as to, you know, fight to, she, she fought to advance voting rights, promote tribal sovereignty, and to protect uh, our environment, our secular waters, and our, our cultural resources. And, and before that, she was also a Clinton and Obama presidential appointee. Uh, and worked as a White House Fellow on housing issues and as Vice Chair of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which I know is uh, certainly relevant to, to our conversation today. Uh, and lastly, I just want to, you know, for those again who don't know, um, say that New Mexico's third district, uh, you know, encompasses pretty much all of northern New Mexico, uh, as well as 19 federally recognized tribes, uh, a large swath of federal lands, and, you know, in her role uh, as a congresswoman and before that you know the congresswoman knows that uh, cultural and historic preservation is a really big part of honoring and maintaining new mexican values and and ways of life and, and the same goes for communities across the country um, so with that in mind uh you know she was very very excited to introduce hr 6589 at the beginning of this year uh, the historic preservation enhancement act uh, and, and as the slide that is in front of you all, uh, you know, notes, uh, this bill would provide permanent authorization to the Historic Preservation Fund. Uh, and we know that this is important for providing long-term certainty uh, to the Historic Preservation Fund, uh, especially considering, you know, the, that its current authorization is coming up uh, in the near future. Uh, and the bill would also double deposits into the HPF to $300 million for each fiscal year. So that's double uh, the current deposits of $150 million. And again, you know, the, the Congresswoman feels like this is important for expanding uh, the great work uh, that, you know, state historic preservation offices, tribal historic preservation offices, the, the many uh, other grant programs that are, are funded uh, by the HPF being able to, to build and expand on the great work. That, that all those folks do. Uh, and lastly, you know, the bill uh, makes amounts in the HPF available for expenditure without further 
further congressional appropriations. And, and in other words, uh, this means that, uh, you know, funds uh, deposited in the Historic Preservation Fund are actually made available every year. So they're not reliant on the annual appropriations process. And we know this is important uh, considering that for most of the, the Historic Preservation Fund's life, it has not received the full 150 million uh, that it was first authorized at. Uh, so in other words, you know, this bill would, uh, you know, make sure the HPF uh, is around permanently that we're uh, expanding the amount of funding available through it. And that funding is going to be available uh, consistently, sustainably, and with certainty for, for all those that use it. And, and in addition to, to this bill, I do wanna note that uh, the bill builds upon an amendment that the Congresswoman was able to pass through the, the House of Representatives as part of the, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And that amendment, uh, wasn't as comprehensive as this bill, but it would have permanently authorized the Historic Preservation Fund and increased its deposits to $300 million. Uh, unfortunately, the Senate wasn't able to include that language in, in their final bill uh, and what we all know now as the, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, but I think it's uh, important to note uh, that, that we have passed some of this language through the House of Representatives, uh, and that's a good uh, you know demonstration and marker for, for Historic preservation getting uh, support uh, of a large swath of the the members in the House, uh, and I think you know, as the Congresswoman uh, continues to advocate for historic preservation and specifically this bill, I think um, there are a few things uh, I want to point out about why she's so excited about this, and and one is obvious. You know, she knows that there is inherent value uh, in better preserving our history and cultures uh, in New Mexico. Uh, and across the country, and in New Mexico, we certainly have a, a diverse uh, and unique set of history and cultures. Uh, but she, the Congresswoman uh, also likes to highlight that the HPF, and specifically her bill, the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act, supports economic development uh, across the country, but especially in rural communities. Uh, and that's through things like heritage tourism, uh, building, uh, uh, you know, pursuing revitalization projects um, you know, in historic downtowns or buildings uh, and facilitating the use of, of things like this or tax credit or uh, you know, supporting our state and tribal historic preservation offices and the role they play in, in facilitating infrastructure projects that require section 106 review and, and making sure that you know, projects uh, like that can, can move forward in a responsible way. Uh, and, and as the, you know, following the introduction uh, of the bill uh, and really highlighting uh, all these good reasons why uh, it's important, uh, we were fortunate enough to have a hearing in the Natural Resources Committee, uh, specifically the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands, uh, which was a great opportunity to to highlight uh, the, the bill for, for members in that committee. Unfortunately, we did receive some pushback um, from, from our colleagues on the, the other side of the aisle um, as it relates to federal spending. Uh, but certainly as we move forward, uh, the Congresswoman is going to be on the lookout for opportunities to move this bill forward. And, and I know many of you have already done this already, but, uh, and a really big shout out to the, the National Trust too for, for helping to lead these efforts. But the Congresswoman uh, really appreciates uh, the National Trust and, and those across the country continuing to ad educate and advocate for this bill when talking with member offices. Uh, you know, I think a lot of folks and a lot of my colleagues on, on the Hill just uh, aren't uh, maybe as knowledgeable about at all the good that the HPF does, uh, as well as the, the growing need for these investments, uh, you know, as we're, we're seeing the demand for historic and cultural preservation increase over time. And, uh, and as we're seeing, you know, this sort of growth and, uh, and infrastructure projects that are, that are much needed, but, you know, through the, through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the inflation reduction act, um, uh, and, and yeah, you know, with that in mind, um, want to thank the national trust again for, for having me and look forward to answering, uh, any questions y'all may have. Well, great, James. Thank you so much. And uh, we just want to thank the Congresswoman again for her leadership. We feel uh, not just the trust, but the broader preservation community feels uh, just very lucky to have 
uh, such a strong advocate uh, serving serving in Congress and and someone with uh, that technical background to understand uh, the the issue. So we we are we're we're glad she's here uh, and a champion for for these efforts. Um, I did want to uh, before we're going to move to a Q and A section, uh, but I thought I'd quickly just recap um, the historic preservation fund ask on on this chart here. Um, and just make sure people knew where we were uh, in, in the legislative process in terms of appropriations. And of course, um, what, uh, what, what James and the Congresswoman are working on is the authorization, which would carry the program well into the future. Uh, what we have before us before the end of the year, uh, hopefully, is the FY23 appropriations for the program. And uh, I wanted to flag where we where we are with that, and what we're encouraging advocates to to relay to the Hill uh, next week. So uh, there is currently a continuing resolution, uh, which is a temporary funding measure that funds the government uh, until Congress can pass uh, its appropriations bills. Um, when when Congress hasn't passed many of those bills, they often get um, put together in what's called an omnibus public or uh, omnibus appropriations bill and uh, uh, and passed passed all at once. And uh, so where we where we are now is in the midst of seeing if Congress can come to an agreement on that on that larger bill. And uh, we have different levels of, of funding for the HPF uh, from the House and Senate. Um, the, the ask of the coalition, and we certainly have the support of uh, Congressman Ledger Fernandez on the ask for 200 million in FY23. Uh, and what you'll see from, from this slide is um, how close we're getting there. So the House uh, uh, appropriations uh, put the, uh, the funding for HPF at 170, uh, just over 170 million. And the Senate uh, level that came out of the Senate Appropriations Committee from from Senator Leahy and the chairman uh, was 191 million. So uh, a couple key takeaways here: one, um, Congress has has seen just what James was describing, which is uh, an increasing need for funding for uh, historic preservation activities and, and programs, and. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago when uh, we were we were increasing incrementally uh, toward 150 million, and in the past few years, we've seen um, strong support from Congress for for HPF funding. Uh, so that's that's a key takeaway. So there's a big thank you to Congress now for recognizing that and increasing fairly significantly for, for a lot of HBF funding over the last few years. Uh, and then also to support um, the higher number, uh, which gets closer to uh, representing the need. And uh, that that um, you know, we, we hope Congress will address during the lame duck session. Uh, something will need to happen, either another continuing resolution or reaching agreement on the uh, on on the omnibus appropriations bill. So uh, this is also included in your advocacy materials, just an overview of the HPF and all that it does to support uh, historic preservation uh, across the country. So with that, I think we are going to turn to a few questions. Uh, so I think we can bring folks back onto the screen. And... Uh, there are a couple questions. Um, I'll start off with with one that I see, which is um, which is what is the ask uh, for people that have already co-sponsored the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act? And I think um, first it would be a thank you uh, and recognition of the the importance of of modernizing the credit and all that it can do to. Uh, spur economic and community revitalization. The ask, uh, you know, would be to uh, 
indicate to the sponsors of the bill that um, you know either either at the staff level at the or at the member level that uh, they'd like to see this bill pass before the end of the year and they support their efforts to try to include it in an end of the year tax package. It's it's all about creating momentum and, and some buzz, and so um, I think that is one one effective ask at this stage in the in the legislative session, um, and of course uh, encouraging other members, like minded members, to to join on as well. So um, just because they've co-sponsored doesn't mean they they uh, if they're so inclined and want to do more, there's always always more to do from an advocacy standpoint. So those are just a few suggestions. I don't know if if others have uh, other ideas as well. Yeah, I think also to add to that, depending on the staffer you're meeting with in that meeting, um, you can make some of the other asks that um, were outlined on the webinar today. Um, either the public lands bills I mentioned, um, HPF funding. I think those are all opportunities and we have resources available for you to include those in your meeting after your thank you on the tax credit. Uh, we had another question about how does the HPF request relate to the changes in apportionment? Uh, that is a good, very good question and, and certainly timely. Uh, I, my um, su suggestion there is that, that uh, there is a relationship between uh, what Congress appropriates and the apportionment formula. Uh, uh, and for folks who are unaware, the apportionment is the amount of HPF funding that is distributed to the State Historic Preservation Offices uh, e each year based on a number of criteria, but primarily based on census data and population. And uh, as you might suspect, uh, some states are increasing in population, others are decreasing. And so you, you, uh, when you apportion those funds, that can result in changes uh, and uh, 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 those changes can re result in states receiving fewer HPF dollars or more. And uh, the, the, the key there is that if we can meet the uh, request, our request uh, of, of Congress and the administration for uh, the, the state historic preservation offices is 65, 65 million. Uh, the, the Senate has that at 61, and the House has that at, at about 58 million. Uh, what we're going to need to do is get that ship of funding up to at least 62 million. And I think once we reach that mark, uh, it um, it ensures that there is no decrease. Uh, uh, essentially, there um, e each ship of would receive uh, either flat or an increase. So that that I think is the relationship to be mindful of there. Uh, and also a, a key incentive on the HPF ask that uh, we really want the 65, but uh, at least uh, where, the, where, the, where the Senate is coming out, uh, plus a little bit more at 62 is, is where we want to be. Uh, but a, a good question. Uh, are there any asks being made related to the historic easement program? Um, another, another good question. Uh, I think a portion of the advocacy as, as we've designed it for next week is that uh, we've got our core asks uh, between uh, specific legislation that Pam noted, uh, the HPF asks and the authorization bill that, that James outlined. Um, um, the tax tax credit, of course, and uh, and then other so scenic byways. You could certainly include that as part of your ask or other priorities that uh, that you see. Um, so we we did want to leave that open to folks to advance uh, other priorities that they may see in their communities uh, or or even at the federal level. In in terms of the easement program, there there is legislation out there that would modify. Uh, uh, conservation easements, uh, which is uh, sort of the umbrella, which includes historic preservation easements, uh, and that that is the uh, charitable 
Easement Conservation uh, Program Act that was included in uh, uh, in legislation that moved uh, through the Senate Finance Committee uh, through the and was attached to the Earn Act, and the Earn Act is a retirement uh, benefit um, uh, reform type bill that is a priority and is being talked about as as one of the potential pieces of legislation that could come up in the lame duck session. Um, the, the National Trust is supportive of that that bill, and uh, we we believe that uh, enactment will will help uh, unfreeze some of the activity uh, in this space, and hopefully unfreeze uh, 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 the preservation easements and and see more more buildings preserved that way. Um, I could turn it over to others, but perhaps James, uh, you have a sense for maybe just the lame duck and whether the EARN Act is something that you're hearing about in, in the house uh, as a priority or, or anything on that, on that front might be helpful. Yeah, thanks, Shaw. And, you know, I would hesitate to predict anything that Congress may or may not do. Uh, and but I think at the end of the day, it's going to come down to what um, the election, how the elections turn out uh, and sort of what the House looks like uh, in the next Congress, I think, is going to help guide a lot of what happens the rest uh, of this go around. But uh, I think there's certainly a lot of different uh, different priorities and, and competing priorities in the mix. And, and there's a lot of folks that, uh, you know, are retiring and may not be around next Congress that have uh, priorities of their own. So I think it's going to be uh, certainly a dynamic and interesting uh, last few months of the, the year, but I think um, exactly how things shake out is really going to depend on uh, what happens in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, James. To be determined. Um, we uh, have another question on uh, transportation enhancements uh, and what might be learned from the, uh, the the demise of transportation enhancements grants which benefited historic preservation. Um, why don't I kick it off and then Mark or James, if you have any any anything to add, please please do. Uh, I I know that. Um, that uh, we saw certainly a dilution of the transportation enhancement program benefiting historic preservation. Uh, historic preservation is still a uh, an act eligible activity within the um, transportation uh, uh, enhancements program, which which changed names, but it was supported through the uh, infrastructure bill, and uh, funding for that was increased. Um, so, uh, I think it is something as a preservation community, we need to keep our eye on in, in terms of, uh, uh, ensuring that historic preservation projects are, uh, competitive and being considered as part of that. Um, so let me pause there and, and perhaps others have some thoughts. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear how scenic America might engage on, on, on using use of some of those, uh, transportation funding and James, I don't want to leave you out. So if you have anything to add on there, please, please feel free as well. Great. Um, yeah. As far as um, Rhonda just posted uh, a link, you know, to the successor to the transportation enhancements program, which is called transportation uh, alternatives, um, which itself I believe is also a successor to the transportation alternatives program. So it has been a number of, name changes of this program over the years. Um, but you can see that um, this actually uh, received a substantial increase in funding with the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and um, so 21, uh, this program, uh, the transportation alternatives, it's a set aside from the surface transportation block grant program. Uh, in, 20, in FY21, it was $850 million. And between FY22 and 26, it's, it hovers around $1.5 billion per year. So that's a pretty substantial increase. 
And, um, and so um, there is, uh, you know, funds that are used for this. It's not quite exactly the same program as uh, transportation um, uh, enhancements, but um, it is uh, uh, still the same spirit uh, of what it was and indeed refers back to uh, uh, the old transportation enhancement program, even in its authority. So, um, you know, as far as the lesson learned, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's really the theme of this, of this workshop, this, you know, event, which is, you know, we need to keep advocating. We need to make sure that your voices are heard. If this is a, uh, if this is something that's important to you, which it's at Scenic America, we think it's critical, um, then you need to advocate for it. And so that's what it comes down to. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we had a question about um, a potential flip in the House to Republican control and what that might mean for uh, uh, downward pressure on federal spending. Um, and, you know, without uh, being at, realizing that it, it may be difficult to be specific on that point, James, perhaps you might, um, perhaps you might speak to uh, a little bit more about the hearing uh, on HPF reauthorization and, and um, uh, um, some of the concern about about spending and and um, what you expect perhaps from from the committee there or what uh, what you might be anticipating on that on that front. Sure, thanks, Shaw. You know, in the hearing uh, that the Natural Resources Committee, the and specifically the subcommittee for National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands held. Uh, on the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act. We certainly heard uh, concerns from our, our Republican colleagues uh, regarding uh, you know, federal spending, generally speaking, uh, and, and the contributions to federal uh, spending, uh, that an increase in the deposits to the Historic Preservation Fund would make, and, and you know, uh, similar concerns with, with making that funding uh, mandatory moving forward. Uh, and I think, you know, as I understand it, you know, there are a lot of concerns about how that funding uh, may contribute to uh, inflation uh, in addition to the deficit. I think, you know, we'll continue to hear those concerns moving forward. Uh, and, and I don't want to speak to exactly what would happen, uh, you know, in, in a future Congress uh, with potentially different, uh, a different makeup uh, and a different majority. But I think, um, the the uncertainty that the the future holds i think are, are, are good reasons to continue to advocate and push for additional funding for the historic preservation fund uh in this fiscal year uh, if for no other reason uh but to, to raise the baseline so to speak for any further uh conversations and negotiations that that may occur in the future and I would also say that you know it's a good reason to pass my boss's historic preservation enhancement act because that would uh you know eliminate a lot of the uncertainty uh, moving forward, that may come with uh, changes in power in either the House the, or, or the Senate. Um, so I think, to in conclusion, I think the the uncertainty that that we may be seeing moving forward, I think, are good reasons to continue to to fight for for adequate funding uh, this fiscal year, and also uh, to continue to support the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act to to try and uh, find a more durable solution moving forward. Well said, James. Thank you. Um, so I think we're we're uh, I think that we're we got through most of the questions there. So thank you everybody for participating. I think we're nearing the end of our time. Uh, but before we wrap up, if we could just switch to our last slide there. Um, we wanted to provide some additional information about staying connected to the government relations department's work. Uh, you can visit the Advocacy Resource Center on Forum and subscribe to our monthly advocacy newsletter. Um, so with, with that, I want to thank everybody who attended today's workshop. Uh, a special thanks to our speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. 
And uh, remember that on-demand sessions are available now on the conference platform. So check out the support telling the full American story through efforts to reauthorize the Historic Preservation Fund session produced uh, by the government relations team as well, where, where we do go into uh, a bit more detail on, uh, on, on the grant programs that the HPF funds and uh, what you can do to support uh, Congresswoman Teresa Fernandez, Lesser Fernandez's uh, legislation. So we hope to see everyone during the scheduled content uh, for, running from November 1st through 4th. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact uh, the policy at savingplaces.org. And uh, thank you very much for joining today.